I will be there. Okay. I'll be joining remotely. Yes, I I think uh, I anticipate that, and uh, Carrie Hicks will be joining remotely, and um, Tom Moran uh, wanted he's he's particularly interested in Carrie's uh, presentation, and um, so I'll be sharing the remote access with um, the uh, Fleet Working Group, and there might be a couple other folks who join in. Excellent. That's great. Yeah. So, um, yeah, why don't we go ahead and get started? And um, I think I think we hopefully have a pretty good agenda for our meeting in a couple more weeks. Uh, another thing that I'm doing that I didn't put on here is that there's a cluster poster an electronic poster that um, I'm going to work on, and I have to get it done this week. I put a placeholder in when it was due last week, and uh, Aaron said I could update it, but I need to get it done this week. Uh, and tomorrow's my day to get that done, and I'll I'll pass it out. But there might not be a lot of time for for comments. Um, but I, I figured. Um, definitely would uh, feature our ORL work and, and talk about some of the questions that we're exploring about um, ORLs across the disasters community and beyond uh, to other uh, end user applications. So a lot of the things that we'll be discussing uh, at our meeting. That sounds great. And Karen, if you need any screen grabs or anything like that to show how it's being displayed in the dashboard, just let me know. Okay. Uh, that might be nice. Dave, why don't you go ahead and, and plan on doing that? I think it would be nice to update. I, I was going to take images from what I had from last year, but uh, updating the images would be really nice. Yeah, because last year we weren't, I don't think we were displaying any of the data layers with ORL levels next to them. And we yeah. have at least, uh, some of them that are, that are, uh, that have ORL levels, at least right now. And once we put, put through, you know, the criteria that carries, uh, you know, developed in the, in the web interface, then, you know, we can adjust those ORL levels. But at least in the poster session, it'll show how they're being represented, at least currently. That sounds really good. Yeah, I think that would be a good way to go. Um, and then, how are you? How are you? I'm sorry, Karen. How are you putting the poster together using PowerPoint or Photoshop or? There's a no. It's PowerPoint, and it's um, there's a template, uh, an ESIP template, and um, I might. I, I saw what a couple other people, other clusters have done, and mostly they're kind of thinking of having a single poster. But some other folks have done uh, up to three charts. So, yeah, depending on, um, uh, well, what I can do is post, uh, why don't I do this? Um, I won't be able to do it until really late tonight uh, but for, or first thing tomorrow morning. I can post it on a Google Docs, and then, um, you know, people can take a look at it and make uh uh, make it editable. Okay. Yeah, whatever you do, just send me the link and I can, or, or I'll email you some some updated uh, figures. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds that sounds good. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. So I see. Hi, Karen. This is Bob. Sorry, I'm late. Oh yeah, I was just uh, I just was gonna say I see that uh, you're on on our attendance list. So I'm glad glad you made it, and uh, uh, we're going to be uh, cooperating on a couple of the of the sessions at the uh, at the meeting. So if what I what I'd like to do is just go ahead and jump into um, our meeting agenda. 
Uh, I've got some open questions still. Um, and uh, and see if, you know, if, if it looks, if these topics look good in the right order. Um, I will say, I think from my perspective in trying to assemble um, the, the set of topics based on our conversations the last couple of months, um, I think that um, uh, where we are now is looking at ways of maturing the ORL concept and making it a little uh, more robust and potentially uh, applicable across broader domains. And that uh, encompasses uh, addressing that problem that we uh, raised, which is that um, there's uh, the ORL, the, tr the trustworthiness and the utility of the data is going to be uh, use case driven. And there might be a whole class of use cases that could share um, the same uh, structure of trusted, useful data that uh, is, is designated with the ORL. Uh, other use cases might not. And so that's that's one of the things that we want to, well, other key cases definitely would not. They, they would have different, uh, different data needs. And, um, and so the ORL, we want to be able to reflect that. And so what are the strategies uh, to do that, to make it uh, more robust? I will say I, I had a very good conversation a couple of weeks ago with Carrie. Uh, she will be um, presenting her pilot uh, and from the All Hazards Consortium and the Sensitive Information Sharing Environment size uh, for the utility applications, they're quite happy with the ORLs and they're just, you know, moving straight ahead. Um, and so her pilot that she's going to be sharing with us is intended to um, give her a chance to exercise uh, this assignment tool. So how the end users are going to assign the ORL uh, levels uh, and the criteria that uh, she talked about at, at, a pre at our previous meetings, uh, she now has in a uh, open source tool that she'll be sharing and she's re really interested and getting feedback from um, the ESIP community uh, on her approach. There might be, you know, just some lessons learned about um, the open source approach that um, uh, might she might be able to benefit benefit from from uh, you know those uh, in our community who've, who've done that kind of thing. Uh, so, with so, that, uh, Karen, go ahead. Yeah. Is our, is Carrie um, is, is is she evolving this uh, online open source tool to be uh, downloaded and adopted by anybody who wants to use it for their purpose? Is that why it's um, you know we'll be providing feedback that could be real helpful to her? Yes, that's right. So she's developing it for the other utility um, uh, companies. The the pub. Uh, public private sector <laughs> private sector companies uh, would have access to this tool that she's providing through size yes so okay, great thank you yeah so uh, and Tom Moran uh, who will be joining remotely especially for her presentation is, is really quite interested in this the um, the next uh, 3DM, which is our data-driven decision-making uh, workshops, uh, that's going to be happening in September in the Washington, D.C. area. So Carrie's work here is going to be kind of a preliminary before presenting it uh, 
to to that group, which would be the the actual users of that tool. And thus far, um, I've been attending most of the Friday meetings of that group, and they're uh, very very excited about this ORL. So there's a lot of FEMA participation. Uh, they say this is just what is needed. They're really happy to see that it's coming from the uh, private sector. Um, so I think we're we're definitely producing and supporting something in collaboration uh, with the All Hazards Consortium that um, this is going to be um, used. And so we would um, we would give. Yeah, give Carrie an opportunity then to uh, demonstrate that pilot, get the feedback, and um, refine her work uh, before you know pre she presents it to that community of end users. And then um, let's see, I sort of jumped over <laughs> the topics here. Um, the the I wanted to give a, a quick overview of how the ORLs uh, fit into the whole um, data discovery, data evaluation, data access, uh, data delivery pipeline, if you will, and, uh, and kind of uh, give a, a, an update of where the um, All Hazards Consortium is. They, they have uh, completed a use case template, and um, I can share that with the group, and I should do that in advance. But I thought I would go over the template, and one of the questions I, I have is from a science data provider for these applications, does the template do, um, uh, are, there, are there any gaps in the template that we could suggest that, that would make it um, a lot easier to find uh, some of the data that we're aware of. Uh, so, that's so is this? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Karen. Uh, this is Bob again. I was just wondering, is this template to be used by the uh, data users or the data producers? It's used by the data users. I see. So it very much is focused on how uh, the community, you know, how a user in the community uh, finds a problem, describes the problem, and uh, explains from their point of view what's missing um, and uh, what they think they need. If you know, if they don't have any access, it uh, to something at all. In many cases, they're actually identifying uh, products themselves, things like Gas Buddy um, or uh, tools that, uh, you know, give them um, the kind of information they need for transportation, the transport of, of trucks and supplies. Uh, so that's a, a huge part. So they're, uh, they're identifying that kind of data um, and it's from their perspective. Sure. And what I'm hoping we can do is using their use cases to understand their problems um, that we can tell them about. We have to we have to bridge the understanding gap. I mean, they don't know about the various products that are available. And, um, and so will their use case give us enough insight so that we can look at a data product or an application that we have developed um, that can, we think can help them solve their problems? So that's part of the discovery process that uh, I'm hoping uh, we can activate and, um, you know, see see how that can work. Once we identify a data product, we've got the 
uh, the dashboard, the geo-collaborate environment that's uh, now uh, part of the size, the sensitive information sharing environment, uh, a, a key part of it. And we can use those capabilities to demonstrate and exercise uh, data in simulations. So um, that's, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm kind of hoping we can address in refining uh, the ORLs. And in any refinements that we do, we want to be careful that we don't um, do any harm to the ORL uh, as it's being used by <laughs> um, by Terry. Um, so we want to have, uh, hopefully we can uh, move forward without having to um, restructure fundamental parts of the uh, ORL. So um, I plan to put together a few charts to um, uh, lay that groundwork and then turn it over to Carrie uh, and she will uh, describe her software tools for um, implementing uh, ORLs and when she calls it the implementation it's really um, assigning, uh, assigning them um, then they get integrated into the dashboard, and after Carrie's discussion, um, Dave was going to um, do a demonstration and really discuss uh, how, well, Dave, do you want to go ahead and, and just remark on, on your part of that the story? Sure. The, uh, the, the All Hazards Consortium and Sensitive Information uh, Sharing Environment folks wanted to see how the ORL data levels would be represented within the dashboard that they use, both the Fleet Response Working Group and uh, they stood up another one called uh, 1SO for One Stop Ops. Um, so those uh, data sets that appear in the dashboard, they wanted to have some sort of ORL level associated with them. And so while it's preliminary, uh, we identified some of the NOAA with National Weather Service data sets as mostly ORL1, some are ORL2, uh, but as we work through the the, work, the uh, online form with Cary, uh, some of those data sets might go to ORL2 uh, from the National Weather Service because they're not uh, following any sort of standards for metadata or um, making the data or information clickable or providing a legend or, you know, things like that. So, so we're, I'll do a pretty fast uh, demonstration on how the ORL levels are uh, are described and ones that don't have ORL levels will put through uh, once uh, Carrie's process um, matures and it's ready to go or we decide, hey, it's ready to go, we can apply it to some of these within the All Hazards Consortium for their uses, um, then I can go through and label more of them with uh, Tom Moran or or someone else from the All Hazards Consortium. So that's uh, that's kind of the the layout of that portion. Um, you know how we are working with um, the All Hazards Consortium on on the ORLs. Um, the um, but before we would get into a discussion on next steps, I did want to kind of come back to uh, Maggie and ask if. Um, there are aspects of of your continuing work with uh, California and the earthquake preparedness work that that uh, you're involved with, or, or anything else <laughs> that um, uh, you feel might uh, contribute to uh, this goal of of refining the the ORLs. Um, you know, I think that one of the, the, the good examples, and I, I think I talked about it a little bit at the, the last meeting, was this um, the wildfire um, that we responded to um, in, in um, October and, or December, 
October and December, well, whenever it was that last year, um, last year and this year, um, I think that that was a really good use case for us because it really opened our eyes to like how NASA was responding with the state to um, providing um, what we were hoping to be operational data, but ended up not being so helpful. Um, <laughs> So that might be a really good um, kind of use case for, for um, helping with, um, you know, kind of um, how NASA is trying to bridge the gap with our end users in California um, and, and how we might be um, trying to, to um, work with them for the next haywired um, uh, exercise that they're doing in, in uh, August, which is a, a earthquake exercise but also you know potentially you know branches out to all manner of um, preparedness for response I think that does sound really good um, hey Maggie mm -hmm. hey this is Dave I just had a question for you what aspect of the NASA data did they not find um, that helpful was it was it uh, latency issues or resolution well, it was a little of, uh, of everything. So um, we weren't able to get um, the, the uh, airborne assets up in the air because we were busy negotiating, trying to get what they needed. Um, and we didn't have in place the, the um, agreement to be able to fly um, the air assets um, ahead of time. And so it was very difficult to get, um, first of all, an idea from the state what they needed. Second of all, from NASA, what we could fly, um, you know, ahead of time from them. Um, and so it was weeks of, do you need this? Are you sure you need this? Do you really need this? Can, can we help you with this? And then by the time we de determined that it might be helpful, it was too late to really help them. The second thing was the products that we could provide them. It wasn't necessarily 100% um, um, you know, obvious that it was, um, first of all, um, the, not, the, not the same information that they could have gotten anywhere else. Um, and um, secondly, it, it wasn't, we weren't sure that they were able to even ingest it into their system. So there was some work that we needed to do to be able to provide them with data in a, a um, in a manner that they could, um, first of all, ingest into their systems, and um, also there was that latency um, problem as well. So there was um, data integration issues, um, data format issues, um, data latency issues, um, and also so the fact that that you know a lot of the data that we could provide them was optical data that they could get from um, HDDS. So it wasn't like NASA was providing unique data. We were just helping them along to, to getting the data. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Maggie, um, you're actually working then with uh, the wildfire community in, in this case, or is there a, a very large overlap with your earthquake? Um, in this case, we were, we were working um, a little bit of, with both um, communities because we were um, initially contacted by um, people that we had contacts with through the um, earthquake community, but then we were drawn into the wildfire community as a result of that. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good example of uh, how things will be working for us going forward. Uh, so I think that would be an, an excellent discussion. So we can, um, you and I can follow up on that so I can get uh, a title in and uh, sure. I think it might make sense to do that um, after we, uh, you know, discuss the um, the work with the, um, well, it could be either after or, or first thing, um, after we discuss the ORL work with the All Hazards Consortium. So uh, you, could, you can, Give me give me some <laughs> advice uh, after today uh, uh, on on how we can factor that in because I think that'd be very valuable uh, discussion to have sure. under our belt. Sure. Um, and it leads in actually very well with um, the 
the next topic about um, different ways that we can mature the ORL concept. So I've been in some discussions with um, with Ken, following up on the uh, augmented metadata uh, that he brought forward to us um, back in January, February timeframe, and. Um, Basically, well, Ken, do you want to just say a couple a couple of words about you know how how that fits in then with uh, what we're trying to do with maturing ORLs and making them more robust for more communities? Yeah, I guess the, the ideas have been kind of bounced around. Is that I mean, it's really great what Size and and Carrie are doing with the ORLs, and they've really taken that way downstream and are doing some real good stuff with, with that. But in essence, that's really a, a community specific, in this case, the electric utility um, partners that are doing that specific work. And while they probably have some really generalized concepts in the metadata that they're collecting about the data set, there's probably also some very uh, community specific things that they're doing that, that really just serves their purpose. So I think what's been discussed is that from an ESA perspective, then how how do we take what they're doing with the, the the ORLs for their particular use and make that more gen more generally useful across other communities? And probably in some discussions with Karen, probably one way to start is try to figure out what they've done that would apply across the board to other groups and stuff, which is probably a good part of what they're doing. But then figure out how to kind of genericize that. And to do that, I think probably figure out kind of a standard uh, way to define the schema for that criteria that they're using so that others can extend that for their, their use and have tools that, that would be able to be written that understands that schema and be able to work with it in a more gen generic fashion. That, that's just some ideas, you know, of ways way that ESIP could actually uh, benefit the larger community, perhaps, with this idea of the ORLs by extending it across across more more groups potentially. Thanks, Ken. So, um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I know you're not you're not available. Uh, at, uh, for our meeting, um, but um, Bob, I did I did reach out to Bob Downs and and he's on the line and uh, and yeah. he said that he could help out. Yeah, I'm glad to help. Right. So I think um, yeah, Ken is working up a couple of of slides just to uh, articulate that position and. I'm hoping that uh, you know we can use that as a um, uh, as a discussion point then to figure out how we want to you know what are the next steps uh, in in that area. So I have on on the uh, agenda basically uh, I identified just uh, three areas that I I came up with. <laughs> And uh, certainly, there might be other uh, other next steps that um, quite quite open for uh, feedback from folks. But um, so the one the additional criteria on how users could benefit, um, or, or the criteria for the ORLs. Let's see. Are there so 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 Karen? I mean, one thing that Dave mentioned earlier might be of interest too, is that he's going to try to demonstrate how to display the URLs in his dashboard, and I think that's a good example that it's an additional application and that's trying to plug in and get that URL information, right? So I think that's that's kind of a critical piece there is that you need somewhere, and I'm I'm not sure how Kerry's doing it at, at this point. But a database or some repository of where that 
additional metadata about the data sets is being kept and other applications can tap into that and use it. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Um, I do know that Carrie's work initially is uh, within her own system, but ideally she wants to put that app on the uh, within the size within the whole environment. So in in that case, it would be available to the dashboard to Geo Collaborate. So um, I don't know, Dave. Do you have any? Other insights? Um, well, I, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, working with Carrie as this process sort of gets close to finalization because we could create the ability. I mean, once it spits out an ORL, then what do you do with it? Um, that is then uh, that could be taken by a user and then put into uh, the name of the file, which displays within the dashboard. Or as the ORL, or I should say not or, but and or, um, if the uh, uh, users want a specific uh, layer display of what the ORLs are, then that's something that we could develop into GeoCollaborate. In other words, you know, since, since GeoCollaborate is just a generic collaboration tool for science data, Every user is going to want to create their own operational readiness levels depending on their use cases. So they will be able to identify and put in the ORL numbers for their own use case. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so that'll be completely dependent upon the user environment, which, um, which will then be flexible enough to use the ORL levels as they have different meanings for different types of users. And, you know, whether the research users or collecting data in the field or whether they're operational, you know, utility companies can put their own ORL numbers onto, onto the data layer. So if, if by chance a researcher needs to collaborate with an operational person on something that's happening, uh, they will just have to talk about, um, you know, the ORL levels that they're displaying because they might have two different standards for ORL levels, but they'll have to use this thing called their mouth and communicate. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, depending um, on uh, my understanding of, of how the community anticipates using uh, size and the dashboard, um, they would have it, uh, these tailored views for, diff for, for their specific community. Um, and then it's a matter of, um, yeah, I mean, if you're working with that community, become part of the um, um, authorized users uh, for, for that session. So it'll be... It would be really, really interesting to see how that can uh, get put into place, you know, get put into action. Yeah, and that's that's very true, um, Karen. And how uh, the users interact with the data is then is then um, can lead to a further enhancement or expanding of uh, Geo Collaborate to address those concerns because the, the functionality within GeoCollaborate is totally driven by the users. I mean, while we have lots of ideas at Storm Center, we're not building our ideas into GeoCollaborate until a, you know, a customer um, physically asks for that and they, you know, they say, yes, we need it for this. It's kind of a new agile approach that we're taking to um, decision-making software and situational awareness software that we're not putting anything in there unless it's asked for by a by a user. Yeah, and having the discipline to do that is is very necessary. <laughs> it's very hard for people who have lots of ideas. <laughs> right, Dave. Right. Yeah, uh, Dave. Uh, do you, Miss Bob Downs again? Sorry. I was just wondering, are there 
different kinds of users that you're targeting uh, for for this? Uh, that is uh, different uh, uh, groups that might want be able to use it. Um, yeah, Bob. There there are you know different categories. From I mean, we've started in the operational area, obviously working with the utilities and stuff like that. But there's also the researchers who might be um, collecting data on the ground uh, in ways that they might want to share it in real time back to. Um, back to the university or back to back to the lab or something if they want to see it. Um, so there's researcher to researcher collaborations. There's uh, research to operations. If uh, somebody like NOAA is looking to accelerate uh, the transition of research data to operations, then you can connect researchers to operational, like say weather service or National Ocean Service people, so they can provide immediate feedback as to whether that product is going to be useful or provide uh, feedback that might guide the inclusion of, you know, new channels on satellites or something like that, so they can get more data. So, so there, are, there are a lot of use, um, there are a lot of uses, and we're just going to let the the community as we help to guide different use cases down a path that that allows for innovation within a, a research environment, which is very um, limited, you know, because research, you have to propose ahead of time as to what you're going to do and you have to do that exactly and all that stuff. So, so this environment will probably or hopefully introduce some more flexibility in, in a research environment. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah, and I think too that the um, the All Hazards Consortium folks are pretty. They understand the importance of doing the exercises in advance, and so some of the research topics can be done in a um, you know in an exercise environment, um, and that's that's going to you know, really help for bridging that understanding gap so that um, uh, the operations folks can get a better picture of what's available and um, and then the researchers getting a, a better, deeper understanding of, you know, how their operations unfold. Um, the, the other thing I was going to mention is that the uh, the types of communities that uh, we're already working with, besides say the electric sector, uh, utility sector, is um, pretty strong focus lately on state um, emergency management offices and the and their their centers, EMOC, Emergency Management Operations Center, uh, each state. Um, has such a facility, and uh, you know people who are in charge of that for the state uh, in responding to all manners of disasters. Um, we've been focusing on weather, and but like Maggie was experiencing, you know, you've got uh, wildfires and whatever whatever is occurring. Th those folks are involved, and so there's a whole group of. Um, public sector representatives, uh, both at the state and federal level. And I think that uh, their their view of, um, I think they will come to a point where they, they have their own operational readiness levels because of the importance of situational awareness to the work that they have to do. So, um, I, I think, um, in a way, probably Maggie has seen this as well in uh, in California, is that these are kind of pilot programs for um, identifying uh, those procedures and then our goal um, data and getting that data and applications, the data and applications properly um, exposed to those end users. With, with the ORL concept, and and Karen, I'm th that's 
that's yeah, that's a great description. And the the only other thing that I'll add is that um, you know we've given a lot of thought. I know uh, Bob Downs and I think Bob Chen brought this up early on, and others, of course, concurred that ORL levels are going to have different meaning to different users. And um, what this really what what the the now that we have the data sharing and collaboration environment from which to share some of those ORL data layers, um, it will, we think, help um, researchers or help other users identify what data layers are important to the decision maker because if they're sharing data back and forth and they see the ORL level, you know, somebody might say, oh, that is their level and that's an ORL one. So that's really important for them. We're going to listen to it. We're not going to dive into what, you know, what the metadata is and all that sort of stuff, but they've already identified it as ORL one. So that's a high level decision making data layer. So if, if a researcher sends a piece of data over to an operational decision maker and the researcher says it's an ORL three, the operational person will say, oh, that's an ORL3 from their standpoint and understand why it might be an ORL3. But for them, they might, because it happens to be timely or of a fire or the satellite passed over at the right time, for them, it might be more like an ORL1 and they can use it accordingly. That's down the road. It's in the future as pe more people understand ORL levels, but that's kind of perhaps a use case where different ORL numbers would actually help to educate other users. Yeah, because they, they're, the reason for them is to communicate this kind of information. And um, do it in a way that's highly efficient because you're responding to something and you don't have a lot of time to do the research. You've got to be able to uh, know what it is and move forward. That's right. That's right. So uh, the, the, um, then the other point with the augmented metadata concept, um, when the data providers, our community, um, is trying to figure out um, how to communicate the existence of these different data products to the user, uh, the, the criteria in the ORLs will help us um, expound on how that data can be, uh, be used. And so one of the questions is, um, as Ken was saying, you know, are there uh, some common characteristics of data that uh, from a data provider's point of view, uh, we would know to factor into um, quality criteria and all of these things then would add up into the ORL for its trustworthiness or its, its readiness uh, for use, its usability. And so that's one of the things that um, I'm hoping that we can explore further is that um, if there are um, certain metadata factors that um, that data providers would be regularly looking for uh, in support of or in response to a, a use case, um, can we uh, identify what those are? And I think that they might exist, or that they might indeed be the kinds of things that um, uh, Carrie had, had put in her uh, kind of flowchart for defining ORLs, kind of starting at um, uh, some. Uh, authoritative uh, aspects of the data uh, regarding its source. And these might be things then that overlap with uh, other areas that we're familiar with, uh, digital 
uh, repositories in the way that uh, I know uh, Bob Downs is, is definitely looking at the, the question of um, qualitative and quantitative information about uh, repository data. Um, and yes. Yeah. So, um, are there ways that we can leverage those? You know, have some consistency um, across um, these initiatives. Is that a good word? Initiatives for readiness levels, for trusting data, for repository stewardship kinds of criteria. Um, they're they exist for different purposes, but um, part of uh, they share that same data trustworthiness that we're we're trying to uh, address for our um, operational users, our application users. So those are the questions. Um, I, I wonder if there are uh, feedback from from folks here. Uh, are there other points that we should be um, bringing in to our meeting um, in a couple of weeks uh, or feedback on, on what we've got laid out. Uh, well, uh, this is Bob, sorry again. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any other examples of uh, data use uh, for disasters that we might be able to pick up on and that way we would get some insight from those in terms of how data might or might not uh, have been uh, applicable or even useful for uh, a particular use. So that would be a question for our group. Uh, Maggie has identified one, and so she'll be bringing it forward. Um, I will have the use case that I'll pass out uh, tomorrow. I'll uh, get that into an email so people can take a look at the um, All Hazards Consortium uh, template uh, that Tom Moran filled out as a sample. Do we? Uh, does anyone have other use cases that would be informative to our group? And this is Dave. I think you know probably use cases will arrive during our discussion too. Might might pop up during the discussion in Tucson during this session because it's. I can tell you, use cases. Even when I was in the Pennsylvania Emergency Management Agency and we were training them on how to use Geo Collaborate, when their when their director or their deputy director asked them about, okay. Tell me some use cases and how you would use this. Use this. They really needed time to go back and think, because you know they have to go through the operational procedures in their mind. Now they have some that they're working on, but it, it's, it took them weeks. Good point. So, so use cases won't always just pop up into people's heads because, number one, GeoCollaborate is a new environment in which to share data. Now we're talking about trusted data, and now we're talking about operational readiness levels. So it's a lot of things coming together that um, that provide a good environment for sharing, but it really, if you really want to be effective with the data and delivering the right data to the people at the right time so they can use it, takes a process to to think through and then to come up with a particular use case. Yeah, and it, it, I mean, that, that's one of the things that's been interesting 
uh, as the that public sector subgroup uh, with the All Hazards Consortium. Uh, I mean, it's just that the, the range of, of issues to deal with uh, are things that you know I I just would have no idea about, and so I I know that that's <laughs> That's part of that understanding gap and um, showing people uh, enough of a use case uh, so that they can, you know, start thinking about what their what their own issues and use cases are. Yeah, it'll be an educational uh, process for everybody. Exactly. I'm also wondering, uh, yes, and I'm also wondering if there might be other um, actors here uh, that is either other agencies or service providers that might be able to utilize the data, the ones that we hadn't uh, thought about yet or uh, uh, they might actually be using data uh, and we don't know about it. Yeah. yeah, I think I think there will be a lot of of people that number one want to use new data or want to use data, and people that have no idea where what data is out there that might want to use it once they learn about it. But the nice thing about the sharing environment is, is at least it exposes them to new data, and opens their minds to thinking about other data sources, and then the Federation and All Hazard Consortium and those guys will be there to help them understand the significance of data and trusted data and ORL levels and stuff like that. Yeah, that would be great. We're com coming up to the end of our hour. Um, I did did want to leave it open to uh, any any feedback if there's um, an important topic that got missed. I think uh, those last two ideas um, are things that uh, that is the the use cases and the uh, and the other actors who might have their own use cases that we don't know about. Um, things to try to keep in mind. Um, but um, any other part, pieces of information that we should think about bringing in uh, for our face-to-face -face meeting, or for those of us who will be there, and then of course we'll have all the remote access. But um, the agenda seems okay. Hey, I'm Karen. Uh, on your email, I noticed. Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to pull it up here. You said, uh, here's our descri session description, July 21 at 4 p.m. Is That's it the 20, <laughs> is it the 17th or the 21st? It's the 17th. Yeah, yeah. okay. That was a, I don't know where 21 came from. Okay, so I see it on the agenda and it has at four o'clock and it's operational readiness levels establishing Trusted data to improve situational awareness. Um, yeah. Karen Mo, and we'll have the all the dial-in uh, information, speakers, and um, yeah, we'll be able to pass that out um, since we're on the first day. I'll I'll find out. I think that information is already available. So I wanted to pass it along to uh, Tom Moran and you know all hazards group as well yeah that sounds good and i didn't see a specific like agenda for speakers in there yet does that need to be put in i hope i can still do that that would be that's what this email uh listing and what we've been talking about would be refining that list um so i'm hoping i can um edit uh, the pages there or turn them over to somebody who could insert them. Oh, I'm sure they'll be able to do that. And and is that the only session or is there one on another day? Um, that's the only one that we worked through 
this group. Um, okay. I know that there, there's a couple others that are closely related. Um, uh, Annie Burgess says one that, um, on, well, Bob Downs said, you, you want to, do you have that title of, of the one? Oh, uh, uh, on Thursday. Uh, um, uh, on, yeah, Thursday at 9.30 in the morning, uh, there's a session, uh, uh, Christine White and uh, Trip Corbett, both of Esri, they're uh, running, and um, uh, their uh, their session is looking at the value of um, Earth observation data, um, and so uh, I'm going to be presenting during that session uh, with uh, uh, Karen and uh, Bob Chen will be co-authoring as well uh, about the value of uh, using Earth observation data with socioeconomic data. Um, and so uh, uh, we're looking forward to, to that session. Uh, unfortunately, right at the same time, there's another session that I'm presenting in. So after I present, uh, I'll be leaving Karen there as I go uh, across the hall, I guess, to a, another session where I have to present. Yeah, so, but, but uh, we only have, uh, from our disaster cluster point of view, there, there's only one uh, that we've organized. Uh, there is another one Somebody from USGS had organized. I I can't remember it. Uh, Leslie, I I probably organized that one and I tagged it as disasters cluster, even though I've only attended a few calls. So that one is a bunch of presenters from the USGS that have projects that are related to um, analyzing risk, or uh, they are they are loosely coupled to risk and a larger risk map project that we have. So I'm encouraging all of those speakers to take a look at um, your disasters cluster session and maybe get more involved if they think it is relevant. What time is your session, Leslie? Um, it's on the first day, I, the late morning session right before lunch. Uh, is purple is the one in purple right there supporting integrated and predictive science CDI focus on risk assessment so you can see the uh, names of the the topics are listed there and the speakers and this is um, short term seed funding that they just learned about that they received in March and they have until September to uh, complete the project so they're very short-term projects and we're trying to have them coordinate a little bit uh, under risk assessment. That's what one of the USGS associate directors uh, would like to do. Sounds good. I hope to see some of you there and, and also at the ORL session. Okay. Or at five o'clock, I, I just will mention one other thing that I put in the email, and that is uh, for the fall meeting of uh, AGU. Uh, it's going to be in the Washington, D.C. area. So um, there are a couple of areas where we could um, introduce and, and discuss the uh, ORLs. Hoping to find um, co-authors, <laughs> I'm I'm definitely willing to do one, I guess, uh, or in perhaps co-author um, a second one um, if you know if we um, identify um, good topics. So I put uh, I took a look at. Um, some of the sessions using uh, the AGU sessions and um, came up with a, a couple that I put into the, uh, today's email. So um, 
if there is anyone who is interested in collaborating on on a paper proposal that would be due at the end of the month um, I'd love to have some uh, co-authors uh, to tackle or to, to put into either a poster or a presentation on on our ORL entrusted data work All right. Um, are there uh, just a quick question? Any other sessions that um, people are directly involved in that you'd like to uh, kind of announce before we close up this uh, this afternoon? Okay. Well, this is Bob. Just, I just yeah. want to say thanks for for listing my IN001 in there in that session on evaluation. Great. Um, Karen, this is Maggie. Um, I, I'm co, um, co chairing a session called Advances in Disaster Informatics and Imagery Analysis to Build Resilience to Extreme Events. Um, I'm not sure which, um, I think it's a natural hazard. Um, but I can send the session description if uh, if you want to send that along. Yeah, folks in the cluster. Okay. Yep. I did a, a quick cursory look at the um, the natural hazards one, and I was thinking trusted data, so I had a fairly narrow view. Um, But that that does that that sounds like it would be worth sharing. Okay. I'll send the uh, session description to you. Okay, super. I'll pass it along. Maggie, can you tell me the name of the title again? I just want to write it down here. Sure. It's um, advances in disaster informatics and imagery analysis to build resilience to extreme events. Um, session ID 51878 in natural hazards. Sorry, can you say the title one more time? Advances in des sure. Disasters Information, Informatics and Imagery Analysis. Advances in Disaster Informatics and Imagery Analysis to Build Resilience to Extreme Events. Thank you. Sure. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I will um, uh, work to get our new agenda, uh, I mean, our, our agenda and speakers list up um, and make sure that everybody has the uh, remote access information. Uh, and Maggie, we can talk a little bit more tomorrow, our email. Uh, to get the um, uh, the fires, uh, the wildfire uh, use case that you um, brought up from last year's wildfires, sure. Uh, and, and we can figure out how to uh, where where to put that. Sounds good. Great. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Looking forward to seeing many of you in Tucson and at least uh, hearing from you again. Uh, July 17th. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Karen. Bye. Bye. -bye.